All right. Well, what do you have for us this time, Elliot? Where are we going? Um, well, I guess because we, uh, sorry. <laughs> really, I'm like in Renfield Asylum over Carpac <laughs> Uh I guess because we, I mean, we kept coming back and forth the last couple of times with the kind of like the whole timeline with Dracula and, uh, you know, the gestation and origins of the novel and, and, this, and, and how it was made into a movie. So I guess like, uh, you know, I guess getting back into just a quick recap, we talked a little bit, we talked a lot about Bram Stoker writing it and, uh, you know, how he came up with all these characters in the novel. And, uh, you know, since then I've actually read more stuff. <laughs> and uh, so it's interesting to find out more about just like the backstory, the people in his life that created these characters in the novel that would become iconic characters on, you know, stage and on the silver screen. So uh, like I mentioned a little bit, Henry Irving, he was uh, his boss and basically his like best buddy that he met in the 1870s uh, while living in Dublin and going to Trinity College. And uh, Henry Irving was this huge, huge star all across um, England, the UK, who as an actor, director, uh, and, and even writer, he performed Faust, uh, starring as Mephistopheles, and wow. he did the productions of Hamlet and, and Macbeth, starring as the leaning man in those. And basically by the 1870s, as Stoker was writing all these, uh, his first horror novels and horror stories, like Under the Sunset and these others, he became friends with this man that he looked up to a lot. And uh, it was really come the end of the um, 1870s is where he rose to work for Henry Irving, this famous actor, director, there he is, uh, at, at the Elysium Theater in London. So uh, you can see looking at the real life photographs of Henry Irving, there is that interesting, you know, similarity to the descriptions of Dracula in the book. And as we see on, you know, screen for the next hundred years or so. Uh, so Henry Irving, again, is like, you know, it's a very, very similar um, relationship uh, between Dracula and Renfield, so to speak, is what Irving and uh, Bram Stoker have really with Stoker more on the Renfield uh, part of things. And uh, basically most of, um, you know, his life uh, from the 1880s into the 20th century is really, um, you know, Bram Stoker being, you know, Henry Irving's everything, every man and, and financier running, uh, you know, checks and everything for the Lyceum, taking care of Henry Irving's affairs. And uh, Ellen Terry is also this world renowned very beautiful actress, British actress, who is, uh, you know, there's all these thoughts uh, today that, you know, she basically might have been having an affair with Henry Irving. And definitely, you know, Bram Stoker was very, very fond of her. So it's, again, a little bit of that Jonathan Harker uh, and Mina and Dracula kind of triangle where, you know, this beautiful woman is kind of like being, you know, caught between these two men that have a very powerful place in her life. And, uh, so it's all these intrigue and drama in real life that uh, kind of goes into him writing Dracula. And, um, you know, his brother, I think we talked a little bit before, you know, it's his brother, Bram's brother, that actually had gone away to war at some point, you know, in the 1800s. And he's the one that actually uh, came across Transylvania and Romania. And it's Bram Stoker's brother that told him about Romania and Transylvania and this, you know, the story of this Wallachian prince. And, uh, you know, it's his brother that draws in, um, you know, these ideas about this Prince Vlad Tepish, Vlad, Vlad Dracula. And uh, it's between all this happening as he's writing this in the early 1890s. I got to look up his name because it's such a crazy name. <laughs> but um, he meets uh, this world renowned um, traveler that is like a real life, um, basically like a doctor. And uh, yeah, this, he reached this real life archaeologist doctor scientist who's traveled the world and has actually been to Romania and his name is Arminius Vanbury and Arminius Vanbury is actually the real life Van Helsing and it's because he meets Arminius Vanbury one night backstage at the Lyceum uh, as a guest to Henry Irving in Henry Irving's like private suite which is filled with all this brandy and, and liquor and food. Uh, Arminius Vanbury is the one that tells him really about Vlad Tepish and the real Prince Dracula and uh because Arminius Vanbury is so like, you know, overwhelming of a character, uh, you know, he really does base Van Helsing, almost everything that Van Helsing is, and wow. even dialogue is based on Arminius Vanbury. And uh, so it's interesting, this, again, this whole, 
different uh, cast of characters, uh, you know, coming in and out. Oh, there it is. <laughs> coming cool. in and out of uh, the Lyceum kind of become, you know, basically the um, characters in his novel. And uh, again, as we talked about before, it's, uh, you know, published in 18... And uh, it's published in 1897. It's not a huge success. And, uh, you know, as it goes into the 1900s is where it starts to get more success. And uh, people like H.P. Lovecraft kind of dig up the dirt to say, you know, I don't think he wrote it on his own. And it's kind of come out that another writer named Edith Miniter, she's a female writer, novelist of kind of like weird stories and who uh, actually wrote some, uh, was writing stuff with H.P. Lovecraft herself. It's kind of come out because of H.P. Lovecraft's, you know, research at the time that, you know, Edith did help Bram Stoker assemble a lot of, uh, you know, the story and some of the editing processes that went into making Dracula a novel. So it's, uh, you know, just some little tidbits there. And again, just bringing us up to speed, you know, I talked about Bela Lugosi before and everything, but it's interesting that, you know, Bella was someone struggling actor named Aristat Olt or uh, Bella Ferenc Desco Blasco. He's an Hungarian. He was in World War I. He had to hide under corpses to survive World War I and the gas attacks. So uh, he's really been through the ringer when he finally comes to the States, you know, in the late 1920s. And uh, we talked a little bit about F.W. Murnau, who of course did uh, Nosferatu, which, you know, we've all, I'm sure you guys have seen or have heard about. And, uh, you know, the famous uh, movie that Nicolas Cage produced where um, John Malkovich is, you know, and William Defoe's that you know, like a vampire playing, you know, the part. But uh, basically the guy, F.W. Murnau, who did Nosferatu, you know, he did that without the rights from Florence Balcom Stoker, who was at this time, by that time, Bram Stoker's widow. So Bram Stoker wow. died, I think, in the 1915 or so. And uh, his rights and the rights to Dracula became ownership of Florence Balcom Stoker, who absolutely hated the book. She hated the book. She hated Dracula. She hated everything about it. So um, when F.W. Murnau went and did Nosferatu, he didn't get the rights to it. You know, lawsuit happened and every copy was ordered to be burned and destroyed. Luckily, this didn't happen. But um, what F.W. Murnau kept doing was doing adaptations of books and stories without getting any approval. And uh, very strangely, in the whole Dracula vein of things, the way it all works out, that Bela Lugosi then was in another unlicensed adaptation of Dr. Uh, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, called The Head of Janice. And F.W. Murnau had cast him in that movie. And again, that movie was lost. But again, so Bela Lugosi had this weird kind of very strange metaphysical connection to doing this movie with this director who had just done the first unlicensed version of Dracula really ever made, uh, apart from a, a very lost Hungarian film, I think, that happened before that. So he's kind of kind of got the Dracula mojo coming uh, along with him as he comes to the States in the 1920s. And it's at this time that uh, actor Raymond uh, Huntley has been playing Dracula in Europe. And uh, Hamilton Dean is the first person to actually get the rights from Florence Stoker to make Dracula into a play. And Hamilton Dean has been producing and directing it uh, in London. And it's just starting to get ready to go to the States to tour when Raymond Hunley says, I've had it, I don't want to put it on the cloak anymore, I don't want to do this. And uh, that's when it all comes together that Bela Gossi takes the part of Dracula some point, I think 1926, 1927. And uh, wow. that's how Bela Lugosi gets the role and he starts touring with Dracula, the Hamilton, Hamilton Dean stage version, the very first version of Dracula ever made. He tours with it about 261 times he plays Count Dracula from New York to New Orleans to L.A. to, uh, you know, Buffalo, Syracuse even. And, uh, you know, ironically, his assistant for some of these tours, especially in New York City, is none other than a very young, struggling William Castle who will go on to be, you know, the godfather of B-movies, House on the Haunted Hill, produces Rosemary's Baby. So a little interesting thing there that William Castle is very young at sees being Bella Gossi's assistant you know, during Bela Lugosi's tour as Dracula. And uh, basically, it's a big success. I think Hamilton Dean basically at some point does become Dracula himself after Bela Lugosi gets tired of it. And uh, this kind of brings us up to 1930, where MGM has Lon Chaney, the man of a thousand faces under contract. 
and uh, it's trying to get Lon Chaney to do new jobs. Lon Chaney also has some kind of deal worked out with Universal and Carl Emily Jr. and Sr. to maybe come back to Universal. But uh, basically, Lon Chaney comes down with pneumonia and bronchial cancer and what have you. And, you know, there's all different, you know, reasons why he's still being debated of what really made Lon Chaney got sick and died. But he wants to become Dracula. He wants to play Dracula and he wants to reunite with Todd Browning, who had directed him in between eight and ten different movies, uh, you know, including on Holy Three and London After Midnight. And so he wants to reunite with Todd Browning, who's been a big alcoholic. He's been struggling for years with alcoholism. He's kind of been booted out of the, the studio system, but now he's making a comeback. And uh, Lon Chaney wants to play both Van Helsing and Dracula. And uh, he's actually has character designs and makeup designs, but he starts to get very, very sick. And uh, come July 1930, he's basically stalling MGM to not work, stalling Universal, but he's more interested in doing something with Universal and playing Dracula. That's what to be the role that he wants to come back to as his next project. And uh, basically he worsens as, uh, you know, the MGM switchboards are being flooded with fans from around the world who start learning that Lon Chaney's sick. And, uh, you know, switchboards flooded with people offering kidneys and organs, like anything to save Lon Chaney, who's, again, he's not just a horror star, he is one of the biggest stars in the world. And uh, finally, somewhat by August 1930, Universal's finally got the official rights from Florence Stoker. And uh, they have a Pulitzer Prize winning author write up a 32 page treatment, uh, uh, basically the first real treatment of Dracula for the screen. And uh, they're very excited to get Cheney involved. And uh, unfortunately, August 26, 1930, Len Cheney dies. And that's basically where Carl Emily Jr. and Senior go into a tailspin of what are we going to do now? Like, we just lost one of the greatest stars in history, one of the greatest stars ever, and uh, our star for Dracula. And uh, that's when the hunt goes on to cast anybody. And uh, they start off by casting this guy, that guy, Conrad Veidt, like we had talked about last time, uh, who played, uh, you know, the influence for the Joker and the man who laughs. And uh, they tested everybody. And they finally, someone says, hey, you know, I think it's his son. Junior says, Dad, how about we try the guy who played Dracula 261 times? You know, (laughs) maybe this guy could be right for the part. He's already got the cape. And um, uh, Carl, I mean, okay, okay. He said, let's test them for both. I want to make Frankenstein, I want to make Dracula at the same time. Both of them are slated to start production in 1930, the uh, the summer into the fall. And uh, he tests uh, Lugosi for Frankenstein. Carl Emily Sr. just laughs hysterically at how bad he looks. Uh, <laughs> Lugosi gets pissed and says, I was a great actor in my country. I refuse to be a scarecrow in this one. That's basically his exact <laughs> words. And uh, he's, he's just basically like, screw this. I don't need this. I'm great. And uh, finally, it comes down to negotiation that he gets to part for $500 a week. He, he says, I'm going to wear my own cape from the, the run of touring the country. Uh, no fangs. I refuse to have fangs because I'm amazing looking and I'm beautiful. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so he wants no prosthetics. And, uh, you know, there's some talks, I guess, in different books about, uh, I think, Jack Pierce, uh, the famous, you know, iconic uh, FX creator of, you know, all these great looks for, uh, you know, Frankenstein and the mummy and, and whatever. Uh, you know, I think he had ideas, but look, oh, he says no way. And uh, Todd Browning basically directs the movie with Carl Frund as his DP. And, uh, you know, they shoot that from August 1930, I think, into November. And at the same time, uh, there's this very unknown struggling actor whose real name is William, William Henry Pratt, who is known on the stage as Boris Karloff. And uh, he's been around. He's been hustling for the last, uh, you know, 10 years of his life. And... Uh, He's been a, a heavy in a couple of films and, uh, you know, kind of one liners as the bad guy. And he's a guy who in 1926, while he's walking home from the Universal lot, playing one of a thousand extras or whatever, uh, he looks to his left and he sees this guy slow down off him a ride. And it's Lun Chaney. And wow. in 1926, Lun Chaney gives uh, Boris Karloff a ride home because I guess he recognized him around the lot. And he, he says, you know, what are you doing here? What are you after? And, uh, you know, Carlos says, you know, I really just trying to make as an actor. And uh, 
Cheney says, you know, the key to success in this town is finding something that no one else can do and doing it. And he also says a quote I just found today researching uh, this book I wrote, uh, read. Uh, he basically says, like, if you're going to be an actor, you got to be an actor. You can't ever give up. This is it. This is for the rest of your life. You got to do it until you make it. And, uh, you know, it's those words that really keep Carl out going for the next couple of years until, again, the summer of 1930, as they're about the green lighting, we'll go see Dracula. And now James Whale, who is uh, Hollywood's first out and about uh, homosexual, not closeted, who's very well known. This is a huge thing in 1930. And uh, he's had some success with some epics and some period pieces. And so now he's been handed the reins to make Frankenstein based on a, a John Balderston uh, draft of the uh, Mary Shelley novel and also the stage play that's been being put on since the 1800s uh, based on Mary Shelley's book. So um, James Whale well basically is tasked with casting. And again, it's the same thing. How do we find this guy to play the monster? And uh, there's different stories. And I've read so many books, so there's never like a final bottom line, but it's a mixture of either... His lover, William Lewis, uh, or I forget the real name, but he's either his lover saw him in a Boris Karloff doing a play in Burbank or, you know, James Will had spotted Karloff uh, at the commissary eating one day on the universe a lot. But I think it's really a bit of both that I think his lover uh, that actually did see him in something. And uh, I know that there is some stuff from Karloff's biography where Karloff, you know, he was broke. And he finally got a call from his agent that, hey, this guy wants to see you for an audition. And uh, Karloff couldn't believe it, had no clue. And I think that along with, you know, Karloff meeting James Whale while eating lunch one day all kind of comes together uh, with uh, Whale really seeing this sympathy, this empathy and sympathy that he sees in Karloff's eyes that he, he wants that from his monster. And uh, that's what basically gets Karloff cast. Same thing, summer of 1930. And uh you know, Karloff gets put into makeup by Jack Pierce and, uh, you know, they really hit, hit it off and Pierce starts doing all these, these fantastic ideas we have today. It all comes from Pierce studying, you know, dental books and dental figures and pictures of corpses and cadavers kind of come up with this iconic, you know, box head uh, bolt neck thing that we have today. And, uh, you know, him and Karloff hit it off really well. And, uh, you know, when he starts filming, he, he comes into his dressing room in August of 1930 and he finds out that the very dressing room that he has was Lon Chaney's in this whole time that he was on the lot. So, wow, that's you know, so very, cool. Yeah, very, very full circle. And uh, from there again, Karloff and Lugosi are in a very tandem path now that they're both now in these two movies, making these two movies as unknowns that are going to change their careers and their lives and actually change horror cinema as we know it. And both of them basically wrap around October, November, 1931. And, uh, you know, Karloff had the worst run of anybody up to this point, period, in the history of filmmaking, because he had to do so much hours of makeup to be Frankenstein, taking out one of his bridges that he had. And uh, he's wearing these uh, like very heavy boots and uh, it throws out his back during like the fights with Dwight Fry as the hunchback. And, uh, He's had a rough and it becomes actually this one day when he does the famous uh, scene where he throws the girl in the lake because the girl can't fall right. And she doesn't look like she's drowning. It just goes on and on and on. And they're all the way up in the country above uh, Universal Studios somewhere. And basically it becomes a 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. day, basically a 25 hour working day for Karloff. And again, this is all pre Screen Actors Guild, whatever. And it's because of that day that Karloff really starts to change, you know, studio policies and procedures for acting in general in the industry. And he goes to whatever that current version was of SAG and says, this is insane. And they cut it down to like, okay, from now on, all actors will only have a 16 hour day. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's that. And then again, you know, when he gets into doing the mummy, there's a final day there that is again, atrocious. And it's that final day in the mummy that really does inspire uh, Boris Karloff to eventually create Screen Actors Guild uh, to protect all actors. Wow, who knew that? That's, that's amazing. <laughs> I didn't know any of that shit. So. I didn't either. <laughs> that's so that's a little bit, but, but that, again, that part of history right now where we're at is 1931 and those two guys are unknowns, 
They're both between 43 and 46 and uh, struggling their whole life. And it's that summer of 1930 changes their lives and basically changes horror film history as we know it starts to blow. That's ball incredible. Run. That's yeah. incredible. Now, okay, who starts the rivalry? Where does that start? I, I think, you know, there was that rivalry, like you had mentioned before, and we talked about, um, I, I think it becomes that Karloff uh, starts getting better roles, you know, and, and Lugosi, it's just, he does Dracula. He doesn't want to do Dracula. I think it's a lot of Lugosi's ego. He's just so vain that um, it kind of becomes part of his downfall besides the morphine addiction that we see in Ed Wood. The, movie <laughs> the old morphine addiction. <laughs> I, I love that part of his character. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it's like, you know, I, I think that's the thing. His vanity prevents him from just going with the flow, riding out the universal uh, kind of flow of his career, so to speak. And it keeps biting him in the ass because he says, no, I'm done with Dracula. Then they say, forget it. We're going to make Dracula's daughter with uh, Karloff and you and whatever. And it's going to be a sequel to the Stoker novel based on Dracula's guest. But then that falls through kind of partly because of his negotiating and it becomes Dracula's daughter again, which is its own masterpiece. It's the first, like, really lesbian vampire movie ever. And uh, then he comes back and he does uh, Mark of the Vampire for MGM. And uh, so he just keeps going back and forth. And if he says, I'm not going to play Frankenstein. And I'm sure someone knows, a lot of people know, he eventually does play Frankenstein, the monster. And I think Ghost of Frankenstein or House of Frank. Like, so he just keeps, you know, fighting himself and screwing himself over while Karlov accepts it. And he uses it all to give him roles in other movies. And it's really when he does House of Frankenstein way before that point that he realizes, OK, he's still doing all these like very nice, you know, more classic roles, you know. And uh, it's it's really him realizing, OK, I got to change my strategy and use this to keep me changing it up. And that's how he becomes friends with Val Luton at RKO when Val Luton is launching a whole series of very cheap, modestly budgeted horror pictures and it's because that he does the body snatcher with Lugosi as his co-star which is a very classic black and white horror film it's gothic that changes everything for Karloff because he decides I don't want to keep doing this I'm going to do that and uh, Lugosi ironically is his co-star and Lugosi is incredible the two of them are amazing in that but he you know Lugosi again is just so egotistical where Karloff does that and basically says I love working for Val Luton mm -hmm. In RKO, and he keeps doing pictures with Val Luton RKO that again keep expanding him, showing them the world that he can do more than the typical monster. And well, that's and, why. And, and back again, at that think, time, like that was the shit. Like they were just yeah. oh, they're like, look, we made monsters. Like, could you <laughs> imagine like 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 you know, Lugosi's over there, like, I don't want to put on teeth. And you know, Karloff's like, put me in full shit, whatever. <laughs> hey. you know, like he was like the Doug Jones of that time, you know. Like, yeah. ima imagine yeah. if Doug Jones was back then, he'd be like, Yeah, I'm a fucking lizard, whatever, put me in a thing. I, you know, <laughs> whatever his deal is. But uh, once again, I mean, yeah, LA, you're right, Aaron. That that's a good point. You're right. Like, I mean, to to wrap up, I know we gotta move on, but you're right, like. It is that point in our history, film history, culture, 1931. It's the monster craze. It's just yeah. beginning that. It's the first birth of taking these gothic supervillains and antiheroes that were created 100 years before and making them to movies. That's the phase. Like, whether it's MGM or it's Universal, Hunchback of Notre Dame was made at MGM with Lon Chaney. That's what they're doing. So it's like, yeah, why would you fight that? Just keep doing that. It and was then huge. doing I mean, your bit parts here and there, it's, we which see is these... what Karloff did. He knew to do bit parts in other movies while doing the monster stuff where Lugosi kept saying, no, I'm not doing that. No, no. Like he was just was too, <laughs> too much you, of a diva. You know, we see all the time, those hundred pack of movies for like 20 bucks or whatever. <laughs> and they're all like 1930s shit. That stuff, people were going to all of that. It didn't matter what it was. People went and watched White Zombie and thought it was a good movie. Yeah. That, that shit's boring as fuck if you try it to is, watch it, it nowadays. <laughs> and that's Lugosi too, right? He's in that? Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, boring as fuck. But, you know, if you got a couple buddies there and you're chopping it up, watching the movie, you know, you can have a good time with it. And it's got a good mood to it. So yeah. I, I kind of get it. But, uh, yeah, once again, I didn't know any of that shit. So thank you for teaching me every month a little no bit problem. more. Can I say something real quick? Yeah, yeah whatever you want, man. My, my takeaway from it was this one thing that you said that caught me off guard. 
how people kept calling in and donating, trying to donate their organs. <laughs> <Right. Yeah. laughs> the actors in my life, but I've never said, Hey, take my spleen. Take my yeah. spleen. Right. Yeah, Especially yeah. about that reckless Tom Cruise. He'll take it. He, he's yeah. dangerous. <laughs> Right. Yeah, he'll, he'll fuck all your shit. Tom Cruise. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's another so, time. It's another yeah, time. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty crazy. Uh, Jay, did you have anything to say about that? Uh, I'm just gonna say it's so cool that both these movies happen at the same, you know, in the same time frame, and then we, you know, we can look at every Dracula, every Frankenstein movie after that. Those are, of course, direct influences. But look at all the monster movies: the Jason Voorhees, the all the uh, Freddy is very similar to Dracula. He comes and visits women in their sleep and yeah. you know, takes what he wants. So we have to look at <laughs> not just what they meant at that time, but what they meant to all of us throughout, you know, history that yeah. they yeah. really inspired everybody. Uh, so what, um, what's your, what's one of your favorite vampire films? Uh, uh, do you prefer Bella Lugosi or Christopher Lee? What's your favorite Dracula? Okay. My favorite Dracula <laughs> is Gary Oldman. I mean, oh, I, I'm, a 90, I'm a '90s kid, Gary there Oldman. You, you know, except uh, for when he's got the the the, the buns. Wig. Yeah, the buns, <laughs> the double buns. Uh, but yeah, he's my favorite. I mean, I I know that. Uh, like, I actually watched here a while back the, the Spanish version of Dracula that they did. Like, they shot at night while they were at the same time. Yeah, much better. Yeah. It is better, did, right? Did, did you guys know? Yeah. Did everybody know that, that at the same time they were shooting the Bela Lugosi Dracula, they were also shooting a Spanish version of Dracula in the same sense? Mm, no. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So you can that's watch it and be like, that's the same, but different. But that's yeah, the same. It's the same. <laughs> they use the same sets, they use the same costumes, and they yep. paid them very much less. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You know, a Dracula that I don't think gets much credit is uh, from the Monster Squad. The, I don't remember the actor's <laughs> name. Yeah. But seriously, That's you know, a great like, movie though, yeah, yeah, he's he does a good job. He's very, it's kind of like different. the Wish Universal. He's a, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, he gets enough credit. Like he's like he Dra- he's like job. he's like Dracula. He's, he's Dracula. Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 